you want to turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, and that's where we'll actually start. But first, I want to do a little bit of a review from last week, okay? So what we were talking about was a concept called betrothal. And this word betrothal is also in Luke 127, in the King James Version, they use the word espoused. And basically these two words mean the same thing. Espoused is another way to say betrothal. And what that's talking about is that Joseph was espoused to his wife, Mary. All right. And then she was found with child. And so what we went through last week was we talked about the Jewish wedding or the Jewish marriage. And we likened it, if you will, to salvation. Amen. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to review a lot of those concepts tonight before we move forward in the second part of the marriage ceremony for the ancient Jewish people. OK, but what I want you to know, first off, was that whenever you were betrothed in ancient times, it was different than an engagement. That would be our concept of of a betrothal is today's engagement. But it wasn't really anything like today's engagement. Amen. It wasn't even really like the engagement of the 1940s, at least in the 1940s, when Whenever you got engaged to somebody, more than likely you were going to try to stay faithful to them until you married them. You understand what I'm saying? Or you were going to try not to, at least I think that they tried to, maybe I'm wrong, I think things were just hitting a lot better back then, not to actually what, they, what the Bible calls fornication. It just, that's what the Bible says, Galatians chapter 5, I didn't make it up. It says you're not supposed to have sex outside of marriage. But nevertheless, and so people at that point in time, they, whenever they were engaged, they would try to be faithful in that time frame, or they would be faithful in that time Time frame, but nowadays that's not even the case. It's, it was different with ancient Jewish weddings. With ancient Jewish weddings, when you became betrothed, you were married. Okay, you were married, but then there was a time frame of waiting until the consummation of the marriage. In other words, until they came back together and actually consummated the marriage, where they went behind closed doors, and there was a seven day feast that took place. And 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 the couple, we're going to talk about it just a little bit tonight. I'm not going to get into it too deep. The couple went in there and they consummated the marriage. They had sex for the first time. And so, what I want you to know is, is that it was a listen. Once you were betrothed, you had to have a legal pay of divorce in order to get out of that thing, even if they had not yet come together physically. What I'm trying to explain to you is on a grand scale, I'm trying to take the concept of the Jewish wedding, which is throughout scripture, the concept of wedding or marriage. Amen. And I'm trying to bring it to you to use it to explain salvation history and God's plan for mankind. Ultimately, also, my hope is, is that as I explain this to you, we're going to come back in a couple of weeks. By the way, I'm going on vacation. I won't be here next week. All right. I won't be here for three services, but I got uh, uh, I got some good preachers coming in. Amen. So y'all be faithful to the word of God. Amen. And uh, and, God, and, the, and the word of God is going to feed you. Praise God. All right. But anyway, when I come back on a Thursday night, what we're going to do is we're going to preach. got to go on vacation every now and then. Right. Come on now, somebody help me out here. All right. So. Uh, and so anyway. But what's going to happen is this, is that when we come back, we're going to take the concept of the Jewish wedding and we're going to take a look at the tribulation or a pre-tribulation rapture. And we're going to look at some passages out of Daniel 9. Really where I'm going with all of this is I'm moving towards a topical preaching on the book of Revelation. But we're going to look at some different concepts. And the first concept that I wanted to talk about was how the how the concept of marriage, ancient Jewish marriage and the time frame of that ties into the possibility of a pre-tribulation rapture. Why do you say possibility? Because I'm not taking any stance. I'm going to bring it all out the front. I got my beliefs. I'll tell you what I believe and what I hope for. But I want to look at various aspects. I want to look at it in detail so that we can be aware and prepared that if something happens a little bit different than what we expected, amen, there's going to be a rapture. <laughs> it's going to happen. God's people are going to be taken from this earth. Amen. But don't think that you could not be like the people in Syria. I know nobody wants to hear this. But that you couldn't be like the people in Syria and be persecuted for your faith before that takes place. Right. See, the sad thing is, is that we've bought into an American gospel yeah. that makes you believe that you're going to just eat cotton candy and float away one day and never have to face anything. When the reality of it is, is that over there, I know you can't build a church like this. People start getting freaked out and they want to leave. Don't get freaked out and leave because you still got Jesus to hold on to. Amen. Amen. Hold on to Jesus. He's going to get you through no matter what you're going through. Amen. And, but I'm here to tell you that there's a possibility that you might find, I might find myself in the midst of circumstances that I didn't expect. That's right. 
And I just want to be prepared. Amen. Amen. No matter what I have to face. Amen. Praise God. All right. So we're talking about the Jewish wedding. Now, what? just real quick. What I told you was this, was that. First off, a bride had to be found. And many times the father would look for a bride to find for his son to marry. Okay, remember, we're connecting the Jewish physical wedding to the concept of salvation. All right. And so the father sometimes would send a friend, if you will. They called it a friend or, or send another person to, to find the prospective bride. And, and we used Genesis chapter 24. At, we call it the Eliezer call. I've preached on that. I've talked to you about it multiple times. Many of you should be familiar with it. Abraham, representative of the father. Isaac, which was his son, representative of the promised seed. All right? Just trust me on all this. If you've never heard of Abraham and Isaac, it's okay. Just follow along. I'm going to tell you about these characters. Isaac was a type of Christ. Even 2,000 years before Jesus ever showed up, Isaac in the scripture is painted as a type of Christ because he was a promised seed that came through miraculous circumstances. Amen? He didn't. He was, Sarah's womb was barren. She was 90. Uh, Abraham was 99. There was no way that this was going to be able to be done in the physical, but God God did a, a miracle and he allowed Isaac to come forth. And we also see in Genesis 22 that Isaac is a type of Christ because the word of God says that Abraham laid wood on the lad's back and the lad brought it up on a hill. And there Abraham was about to thrust a knife into the midst of his chest. And the angel of the Lord showed up and said, don't do it. He, he prevented him from, from putting the knife in the boy's chest because I'm telling you that was the picture of what what God was going to do for mankind. He was going to send his only begotten son, his precious son, to carry wood up a hill, amen, and to die on a cross to pay the penalty of sin for you and to pay the penalty of sin for me, amen? amen. And so, listen, so what now Abraham's stricken in years and he sends his servant Eliezer. He sends his servant Eliezer. He says, you need to go find a bride for my son. That's the same thing that God's been doing for thousands of years upon this earth. He's been sending the Holy Spirit to call the bride of Christ to come home. Who will, will you come home? Will you marry the son is what the call's been. And even in Old Testament Israel, before Jesus was here, God was in the business of preparing a nation through which Jesus could come. Amen. And so when Jesus came, now God's trying to bring mankind to Jesus. And so Eliezer went there and he called This is how he prayed. He said, Lord, whenever I, the right woman shows up, I pray that when I ask her for a drink, she would not only give me a drink, but she'd also give my camels a drink. And the point that I wanted to make there is that God is looking for people that have a spot in their heart. That will respond whenever he calls upon them. And Rebecca showed up and she responded the right way. Amen. Not only was there was that an example of looking for the right bride, but God sent John the Baptist beforehand to prepare the way. Remember the story of John the Baptist. He was preaching in the, wilder, the Judean wilderness, clothed with camel hair, a leather belt, eating locusts and wild honey. People thought he was crazy. And he preached a message that said, repent, repent, repair, re prepare ye the way of the Lord. And people went out by the droves to hear the message that he preached. He was preparing a way. And he was the one that went beforehand. And he was preparing them to say, listen, the bridegroom's coming. He actually said that in John chapter 3. He said, I told you that I'm not him. But instead, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And I rejoice to hear his voice. In other words, Jesus showed up. He's the bridegroom. And John the Baptist saw it. And he realized that this was the fulfillment of the promises that God had been given. Amen. Amen. And so, but then the next step in the betrothal. Now, by the way, let me just remind you of something here. This word, this first part of the marriage, it's, it, it's not important that you remember this word. But this is the Jewish word for the first part of the marriage, which is the betrothal. It's called kedushin, and it means sanctified. The word sanctified in the Bible means to be separated. I'm, I'm going to have to be careful because I'm, I, I'm going to eat up all my time. But, you know, let, let's just stop for a second and let, let's, let's just think about this. What, what does it mean to be separated? Well, I draw these pictures a lot, but, you know, but he's, he's not happy. He's dead and he's unhappy right there because he was born of Adam. He was born the first time of Adam and he was born in sin. 
If nobody ever told you that before, you need to understand that that's the problem with humanity. It's not because your daddy treated you wrong. Your daddy treated you wrong because he was born of Adam and he was born of sin. Amen. His daddy treated him wrong because he was born of Adam and he was born in sin. And his daddy before him and his daddy before him. And it's not all about just your environment. That doesn't help the situation. But the fact of the matter is the Bible says that all have been born in the midst of sin because all have come from Adam. Because like the preacher said last week, Adam was the federal head of all humanity. You don't have to believe the garden story if you don't want to. I'm here to tell you that's the truth. That's why man must be born again. Because the first time he's born, he's born dead in sin. And so therefore he must be born again. And what ends up happening is this. Is that God has a plan. And that plan had to do with the cross. The cross and what Jesus died. And whenever you place your faith in what Jesus did, now a translation takes place where you move from the world. See, that's what this is right here. This is the world. You were born into the world. The world system is contrary to the ways of God, in case you didn't know that. The world system is contrary to the ways of God. It's got its own plan. It's got its own perceptions. Hollywood and the music industry, they begin to explain to us and show us what they believe is best for us. And the reality of it is, is everything that they pump into our hearts and in our minds is contrary to what the truth of the Bible is trying to explain to us. And the fact of the matter is, is that we typically believe them more than what we believe the Bible because we haven't taken the time to open the book up. I know because I was in bondage to it. I had the blinders on my own eyes spiritual cataracts and could not see just like Robert as, as an altar boy that didn't believe in anything spiritual I was blinded to the things that I was in that's why Jesus told Nicodemus unless a man is born again he cannot see the kingdom of God Amen. you can't even see it the word of God says in 1 Corinthians 2 14 the logical mind cannot understand the things of God because the natural mind cannot understand the things of God because they're spiritually understood until you give your heart to Jesus and that miracle called salvation takes place on the inside of your heart, you cannot see the things of God and you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We're talking about separation. We're talking about the first part of the Jewish marriage called Kedushin, which means to be sanctified, to be separated out for another. And what I want you to know is this, is that when you get saved and you put your faith in Christ, you have been brought and translated out from the world system and placed into Jesus. And the word of God says that you've been separated out and then you belong to him. Amen. Amen. I want you to see that. Amen. the Bible. Yeah, that's right. Your, your eyes are blind to the Bible. You can't understand it because, because you, you can't understand with your natural mind. Sadly, even though you get born again, many times you can try to read the Bible and still have some difficulty understanding it. That's why we have to grow and, 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 and be taught the Word of God from its proper perspective. And that whenever we do that, we begin to learn. We begin to understand it better. We have to apply ourselves to studying the Scriptures. Amen? All right. And so <clears throat> what I'm trying to tell you is, is that this first part, this betrothal, first off, there had to be a prospective bride. Then the bridegroom had to come to the bride's house to offer marriage. And so Jesus came to our house. And I told you about that. What I meant by that was, is that Jesus was the eternal word that spoke the worlds into existence, but the word became flesh. Amen. Amen. And the word became flesh and dwelled amongst us. The word of God says in Hebrews chapter four that he became flesh and blood because we were flesh and blood. See, we were down here in a bind. The world, we were born of Adam and we needed, we needed to be bought back. And so Jesus became us so that he could offer his sinless life in our place and purchase us back to the father. Amen. And so that's what he did. So the bridegroom had to come. And then what he did was he offered a contract of marriage. There, there was a marriage contract that was offered and they had to be in agreement to it. And when I talked to you about a passage out of Hebrews 9 and how it talked about the new covenant or the new testament and how Jesus, the, the difference between, you understand that this book has, has two parts to it. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi, who's the last of the prophets. And then the first of this, of the New Testament is the Gospel of Matthew, right? And the Old Testament was before Jesus came. And it talks about the nation of Israel and how God was producing a nation so that Jesus could come. And now the New Testament talks about after Jesus came and his teachings and the fact that he died on the cross and that how we now can enter into relationship with him. Amen. And so there's, there's, two, there's two testaments and Jesus was the high priest of the New Testament. And within that concept, there's a contract that's been offered. 
And what I need you to understand is that God's not changing his mind on how he's going to have relationship with man. He's not changing his mind. His plan has always been to give his son to pay the penalty for the sins of mankind. Well, how do you know that, preacher? You sound so confident. Well, all you got to do is read the Old Testament. And you see sacrifice after sacrifice, type after type, foreshadowing after foreshadowing, the, the, the spilling of blood after the spilling of blood, the, the, the brook Kidron, which is over there in Jerusalem, whenever they would offer up sacrifices on Passover, they said it would blow, run Red with blood for a whole week. That's how many animals were sacrificed and slaughtered. The blood persistently and constantly poured out. Why so gruesome? Why is God so gruesome that it would make all these animals be killed? Because you don't understand the severity of sin. You don't understand what it's done to mankind. You don't understand the deception of the liar and what he desires to do and how he desires to destroy and how precious you are in the eyes of God and how much he loves you and how he's bankrupt in heaven to give his precious son to die in your place. And all of those sacrifices were pointing the way to make us understand that this is what God wants. He wants us to humbly come to his plan. And so that's the contract. And you're not gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna accomplish anything to please God. That's why when God gave the promise to Abraham before the law ever came, when God gave this contract or covenant to Abraham in Genesis 15, guess where Abraham was? He fell asleep under the tree. Because God didn't need Abraham in the midst of it. God said, this is my covenant. I'm offering it to you, through you. The seed's going to come. But you know what? You can go ahead and go take a nap right now. Because I don't really need you. Because I'm going to be the, the representative of heaven. See, Jesus became flesh. And I'm going to be the representative of man. He became the son of man. Amen. And that he was also the sacrifice that brought the two together. I need you to see that tonight. Amen. Amen. So he came to the, to the bride's house and he offered a contract and they had to agree upon it. Well, in this contract, the only way you're going to agree is according to Romans chapter 10. And what Romans 10 says is that you have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ actually is the Messiah. He is the one that died, that he rose from the dead. And you have to want him. Amen. You have to want him to be on the inside of you and you have to want to go God's way. God's not going to twist your arm to come on over. He's not. That's not how he works. He, he sent somebody to tell you the truth, to present to you the gospel, and you might not even like it the first time you hear it. I don't know about you, but man, I tell you what, sometimes the first time you hear the gospel and somebody's stepping all over your toes, it feels uncomfortable. But, but you keep on coming back. You don't quit. Let me find out if this stuff's real. You say a prayer on your way home. Not, nobody even has to know that you said it. You say a little prayer on the inside of your heart and in your head. And you say, Lord, if you're real and if what this preacher was saying is real, then do something in me. Show me something. Yeah. I'm going to keep on coming to hear it because you know what? If I'm right, and I use if, I say it a lot because I talk to people that don't believe in Jesus. I want to get them mad. Okay. <laughs> if I'm right and the eternal soul hangs in the balance. And when you breathe your last breath here and you breathe your first breath there, you will wish, I, I will wish if I, if I messed it all up, that I would have listened to a preacher at some point in time. Whenever they were trying to tell me the truth, come on, there ain't no coming back. Once the door's closed, the door's closed. The door, no, you can't pray somebody out of purgatory. Oh my goodness, did you take the time to open the book? The word purgatory is not even in there. Well, where did it come from? It's a damnable heresy. You can't pray somebody out of purgatory. The word of God says to be absent from the to be absent from the body is to be present with, from, with the Lord. The word of God says that it's appointed unto man to die and then the judgment. The, the time that you're going to choose is on this side of eternal life. You've been given an opportunity to receive Jesus, and now's the time to receive him. Amen. 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 Well, so you got to come to the bride's house. He offers a contract. They have to agree. The way that you agree is you say yes to the faith. Amen. You say, yes, Lord. I put my faith in what you sent, which was your precious son, to die on the cross. Amen. And then they had to agree on a purchase price. They called it a dowry. The bridegroom or the, or the groom would offer, it's just another word if you've never heard that before, it means groom, the, the groom that would marry the bride. The bridegroom would offer a purchase price. And, and, and the word of God teaches us that the purchase price in this marriage ceremony was Jesus. The word of God says, it, it, the word is redemption. I'm going to turn real quick. You don't have to. I'm just going to read it real quick to you. Romans chapter 3. 
verse 23 and 24. It says, verse, well, let's start at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, let's start at verse 21. Now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That's talking about Jesus. You realize that you don't have any righteousness in yourself? Yeah. Right. Amen. It's all about him. Amen. Come on. That's a, that's a liberating word right there. Amen. That means that you don't have to fix yourself up and make yourself look all pretty. God knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. The preacher ain't perfect. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. And the truth of the matter is he's not accepting that on his own merits or his own righteousness. Amen. He's accepting that on the righteousness of Jesus. The word of God says right here, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. You might want to answer that because it might be important. And then he goes on to say in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every last one of us. Have, have failed. Every last one of us have, have had problems. Amen. You can answer it. Let them hear the word. It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But look at this verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The, the word redemption literally means to be bought back. I'm talking to you about a purchase price. Yeah. Jesus redeemed us. Through the shedding of his blood, through the giving of his life, his life was sinless. Our life was born in sin. The bridegroom came and offered a price, and the price was the giving of his life. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then a gift was given. And in this case, we've been given at least two gifts that I can tell you about. One is a gift of righteousness. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, it says that the gift that was given is righteousness. When you put your faith in Christ, you were born in sin over here. Amen. Now you've been clothed in him. You've been clothed upon with Jesus. You've been covered with the righteousness of Christ. And it's a gift that's been given to you. You can't earn it. Amen. He gives it to you. But when you really get saved, not only do you get that gift, you also get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. The word of God says that when you truly get saved, and this is how you know that you got saved, is because the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. Amen. Amen. You're going to know. When you really get saved, you'll know it. Nobody's got to try to convince you of it. And the way that it happens is, is that you get sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the word of God says that that's the earnest or the down payment. That's the down payment that you know. Amen. That hallelujah, that, that the word of God works. And that the Lord ha has showed up in your life. He's given you a gift Amen. to show you that this thing is real. Amen. Amen. And now the betrothal begins. Amen. Now this betrothal period begins. And it's a time frame of testing. It's a time frame of testing until the bridegroom comes back for his bride. In the literal Jewish wedding, after the gift was, was agreed upon... After the gift was given, the bridegroom would, would, would return to his father's house. That's out of John chapter 14. He's sitting there talking to his disciples. And his disciples are becoming concerned because they know that he's leaving. And he says, I'm going away. And in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't tell you. And I'm coming back again. Amen. And so the bridegroom would go to his father's house and he'd prepare a place for the bride. And at some point in time, he was coming back for his bride. And literally, we're going to look at at least one parable tonight that shows us that they didn't know when he was going to return. And the fact of the matter is, is that you and I, we can search and I don't mind that we do. And we can look and we can try to figure out the signs and the seasons of when Jesus is going to come back. But the truth of the matter is, the word of God says in Thessalonians, he comes back like a thief in the night. When you're not ready, when you weren't expecting it, the Lord shows up, amen, and hallelujah, we need to be ready. Amen. And so he's gone away on a journey, and now the betrothal begins. Are y'all still with me? Amen. You understand what I'm trying to say here? That there's a time frame that's taking place. So now let's move from this little small idea of an actual Jewish wedding to the big plan of God. That God has created a nation called Israel that he created out of a man named Abraham. 
That's who Abraham was. He said, come out of your father's house. I'm going to make you a nation. He created a nation called Israel through Abraham. And through Israel, he gave us Jesus. And Jesus died on the cross. Amen? And now from that time in the church age, the Holy Spirit is still calling people to come and to marry the Son. Amen. And all this has been known as salvation history. God has been active on the scene. Just because... Just because the majority of the world doesn't know anything about God doesn't mean that God hasn't been active. His word's been here the whole time. The scientists and, and like I said earlier, medicine and everybody around us trying to convince us that it's not real. And the reality of it is, is that he, he's already given us the communication, Amen. but we refuse to read it. And instead we live for ourselves. Lord, help us to have our eyes open that we might be able to see what you're trying to tell us. And that you love us so much that you're moving and operating in the midst of our lives. And so here we are. Salvation history. And we're in the midst of this time frame known as the betrothal. The, the, this, we're being espoused unto Christ. And, and there's, a, there's a testing that's taking place. Come on. There's a testing that's being taken place. A, a testing for your individual life. Whenever you give your heart to the Lord. And now you're betrothed to him. And he's waiting for the day when he's going to come back from his father's house to receive his bride. And the word of God says in Ephesians 5 that he sanctifies his bride. He washes her. He washes her with the water of the word. He takes the word of God and the Holy Spirit and he reveals the work of Jesus in the midst of the scriptures. And when he reveals that to you in the midst of the scriptures, he reveals unto you what's in your heart and in your and on the inside. And there's things in every one of us that aren't right and we're supposed to go to the Lord and say, Lord, take these things from me. Lord, I can't fight this in my own strength. I need your victory. I need your grace that Jesus purchased at the cross. Come in and do a work in me and change me, Lord. Amen? Amen. And so we're in the patrol. All right? And so what I want you to know also is that the, the second part of, of the marriage is known as nuisin. And this word literally means to elevate. So he would come back for his bride from his father's house. I might have spelled that wrong. I might have an H in there somewhere, but anyway, you get the point. He would come back for his bride from his father's house, and he would elevate her or take her with him back to his father's house. I got good news for you. Jesus is coming back. Amen. Amen. It's not always going to be this way. We just got to make sure that we are right with him. Amen. That we've given our heart to him. Praise the Lord. And so now we're going to start tonight's message in Matthew chapter 22. And still right now in Matthew 22, it's a parable. <clears throat> and in this parable, it's talking about really, we're still in the time frame of the betrothal, if you will. This espousing, this, this plan that God has because it's the story of a wedding. It's the story of a wedding with a king. And, he, and, he wants, and he's having a wedding for his son. As a matter of fact, to save some time, I think that I'm going to just kind of tell you a little bit of the story instead of just reading the whole thing. But, but let's look at the first couple of verses. It says in verse 1 and 2, it says, Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parable. So there's an audience listening. I didn't really go back and look. Well, it says the chief priest right there in verse 45 above there. So he's talking to the religious leaders again. You know, people with religious hearts and religious minds have their eyes blinded to the truth. And Jesus was constantly trying to talk to them and explain to them. He says this. He says he's, he, he speaks to them in parables. And this is what he says. The kingdom of heaven is like unto. So a parable takes two things and puts them aside one another for a purpose of comparison. Now, when you hear the word kingdom of heaven, I don't want you to blurt it out, but just stop for a second because I like people to think. What do you think when you think kingdom of heaven? Can I just tell you what I used to think? I used to try to imagine what it was going to be like in heaven. You understand what I'm getting at? Like, what's it going to be like in heaven? And so I was completely missing the point to the whole parable. Like, in other words, okay, one day I'm going to be in heaven. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And so... 
uh, that's what I was thinking, but, but I was completely missing the point. What Jesus is trying to do is explain to carnal man, carnal means physical flesh. He's trying to explain to physical man concepts about how the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God and the word kingdom of heaven are synonymous. They come from another place. They come from another realm. God, God wants to communicate how he handles his business to us down here so that we would better understand it. Now, ultimately, there are things in this parable that talk about when we get to heaven. But right now, today, God wants you and I to have a revelation of how the kingdom of heaven works upon the earth. And Jesus is desiring for people to understand this is what the kingdom of heaven is like in them too. This is what the kingdom of heaven's plan for humanity upon the earth is likened unto. Well, what's it likened unto, Jesus? A king? A king that wanted to have a wedding for his son. That's what it's likened unto. And he wants to have a big old wedding, and he wants to have a big old feast, and he wants to invite everybody to come because he's a good king, and he loves people, and he wants to bless them, and he's saying, hey, Go invite people to come to the wedding feast of my son. And it goes on to say that, you know what, they were bidden. They, they went out and they, they invited them. Even part of this is talking about Old Testament Israel. Telling people to come to marry the son. But it says in the scriptures right here, verse 5, But they made light of it and they went their ways. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. Man, I'm busy. I'm busy and I got things that I have to do. I got some, some farming to do. I got to plow a field. I got to go to work. Come on. I got a new boat, dude. I got things I got to do. I got a new gun. I got to get up. It's hunting season, man. I got to get up in my stand and kill my buck. I don't have a problem if you kill a buck. That's not what I'm talking about. Go get up in your boat. Have some fun on your life. That's all good with me. I don't care about that. You better make sure you hold on to Jesus. You better make sure you have a revelation of what God's plan is for man and that you're connected to him. That's all I'm trying to tell you. And if your boat gets in the way of that, if the deer stand gets in the way of that, if the goofy uh -oh. football gets in the way of that, Lord help me, he had to deliver me from that. It was an idol in my life. It just was. It was an idol in my life. I grew up in football, man. Come on, Travis. Travis knows. Me and him used to, that boy knew how high all them college quarterbacks could jump. That's all we used to talk about. Until Jesus got a hold of our hearts, man. Hey, man. I, I'm probably going to watch some football this year. I ain't going to lie to you. But it is not going to be an idol in my life. It's not going to be a God in my life. I want Jesus number one in my life. Amen. 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 Lord, help me to keep you first. Yes. Everything's going to try to get in your heart and try to get in the way of you and God. Yes. You better make sure you protect that spot. Amen. Amen. Don't let nothing get in the way between you and God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so they made light of it. So you know what he ends up doing is, is this, is that he says... Well, if they want to make light of it, Israel, then you know what? Go into the highways and find as many as you can get to come. So whenever Israel rejected him, then now he begins to talk to you and I. The Israelites who did not want Messiah. Now he begins to talk to the Gentile world, which is people like you and I, born in South Louisiana. People that aren't born Jewish by nature. And now he's ready for the feast. See, one day he's coming back again. And it says right here, verse 11... That there was, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man that did not have on a wedding garment. See, and, and look what it says. And, and he said unto him, friend, you came in here not having a wedding garment. And he was speechless. <laughs> you can't just walk up in this king's wedding without the right attire. You got to receive your garment. You got to be clothed properly. And he knew he was wrong. Don't worry, it's not going to get this far in the real world. It's a parable. If you don't have your wedding garment on, you're not going to be in there to begin with. Jesus is trying to make a point. The point is, you have to be clothed properly in order to be part of this festivity, which is the marriage of the Son, amen? And in order to do that, you got to have a wedding garment. It's called a robe of righteousness. And the way that you receive that is through faith in what Jesus did and for you at the cross and your separation out, hallelujah, from the world into the person of Christ. And now you've been clothed. That's what the Word of God says in Revelation. 
We'll, we'll look at it before we get we'll, before we get out of here. Revelation 19. The armies of heaven clothed with, with, with white linens. The righteousness that's been given to them because of Jesus and his sacrifice. And then he said, verse 13, Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him in outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You're not getting in without your wedding garment. And it's the simplest purchase that you'll ever make because it's already been paid for. You, you get that? It's already been paid for. All you have to do is receive the gift. Amen. That's it. Receive the gift. Jesus already purchased it. All right, Matthew chapter 25. So here's the, key, the parable of the virgins. Now this is talking about, that was about the betrothal. I'm kind of going back and forth. And what I mean by betrothal is I'm talking about that time frame. We're waiting for the bridegroom to come back. Everybody in this room, if you have married yourself to Jesus, you're waiting for the bridegroom to come back and we're in the midst of the betrothal. This par the last parable talked about that time frame of the betrothal where God has been inviting people to come to the wedding this one here is talking about when the bridegroom's coming back. Amen? It says right here, uh, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. So the last, it was, about, it was about a king that had a wedding for his son. Now it's likened unto ten virgins. They took their lamps and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. I did a little bit of research on that today in one of my uh, commentaries that talks about ancient Israel and various the idea was was that the, whenever the bridegrooms would hear the voice of the bride I'm sorry whenever these the, these virgins represent the maidens that were with the bride and when they heard the voice of the bridegroom coming they would rush out to meet him so that they could show him where to come back for the bride and then they would all go back to the bridegroom's house and the fest the, the the feast would begin all right and so that's the idea here that there were 10 virgins which took their lamps and they went forth to meet the bridegroom so they're waiting for him it says five of them were wise and five were foolish the idea behind those words was that one of them the five that were wise they were they were prepared they were waiting with anticipation the ones that were foolish, the word in the Greek is moros. It's where we get the word moron, and it can have a lot of different meanings to it. But the one here is that they become spiritually dull. You just got tired, man. You just got tired of waiting. Got tired of waiting on God. Kind of just decided to do things my own way, you know. And so they got foolish. It says in verse 3, they that were foolish took their lamps, and they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. You know, what we're going to do is, is we're going to find as we move through some more of these stories that this is, a, this is a problem that can happen to people in the church. This is a problem that can happen to the preacher, to you, to anyone who loves God, is that as the bridegroom tarries, we can get a little bit sleepy find ourselves nodding off at times. The fact of the matter is, I guarantee you that we will all get sleepy at some point in time in each and every one of our walks. Come on, somebody. Go ahead, pick your eyes up. Open your eyes up a little bit. I know you're physically tired. I appreciate y'all coming out tonight. It's rough, man, whenever you work like you do. But guess what? I work full-time too, so we're all in the same boat together. Makes it easier, right? Doesn't it make it easier for you to know somebody's going through it with you? Amen. All right. So it says right here that they slumbered and they slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Now, some of the historical reference to this is that when the bridegroom would come, that he would shout and then they would blow a shofar. You ever seen, what, you know what a shofar is? It's like a ram horn. Those ones that are kind of twirled around, they blow them. I tried to blow one one time. It didn't really sound anything like it was supposed to. I don't know if I ever tell you all this story. I probably did. But one time I went to um, Bourbon Street with this guy, Lance, who carried a cross down there. And, um, yeah, Lance, yeah, Lance wrote, 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 yeah. And, man, that was the most amazing thing. And we did some serious witness that night. But this is, how we started this, this is how we started the night. I wish I could tell you the whole story, but I don't have time. He had that big old cross up on his Suburban, and we pulled up over there, and he's like, all right, let's get it down. He starts pulling it down. He's got all these, this sheet thing with blood all over it. He's got this long beard. He looks like John the Baptist. And he pulls out this horn. It's a shofar. 
and he puts his thumb on the bottom of it and he pours some olive oil in it. <laughs> he goes and he says a little prayer. He says, okay, let's go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we prayed. And then he took that show far and he put his lips on it and went, whoop, whoop, and he blew it and all that oil sprayed up in the air. And I was like, man, this is the coolest thing. This dude's like ready for some serious spiritual warfare. And that might seem silly to you, but I'm here to tell you, I've never been more impressed with a witness in my life. When that man carried that cross over there, the closer we got to Bourbon Street, the harder the base was hitting. And the more people you started seeing and the more sin you started feeling. And he just planted that cross right there in the midst of all of that. And he started heading out tracks and telling people that Jesus loved them and that he died for them. And that they didn't repent and give their life to the Lord. Then they were going to split hell wide open. And then they were going to spend eternity in the devil in hell. And can I tell you that most of the people that were partying that didn't know Jesus thought he was a fool. But can I tell you all, oh, they did horrible things. They spit on him. And they took adult novelties and they messed around behind his back. And I'm like, dude, do you even know what they're doing? He said, dude, they've been doing that to me for 10 years. I don't have time to get all caught up and worried about that. They got souls that need to be saved. I got to tell them the truth. They need to hear the truth of the gospel so that their life won't be destroyed. And then Christians that were walking down the street that were backslidden and that were filling themselves with alcohol would come up to him with tears in their eyes and they would thank him. Thank you so much for doing what you do because you reminded me of how much Jesus loves me and I am a heart right. All that because of a shofar. The bridegroom would show up for his bride and there would be a shout and the blowing of the horn the trumpet sound and that's how they would know and these bride these virgins would go out to meet him and then they would come back but five of them were foolish they slumbered and we're like old lands and we're like lands being diligent in the kingdom work to try to stay focused on souls to be reminded that there's people on this earth that need to hear the truth and that if we don't tell them that nobody will help us Lord help us Lord to stay focused amen he goes on to say that uh, verse seven, at, at verse seven, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. These five foolish virgins missed the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, literally what's happened is, is that the five wise ones went and found the bridegroom, brought him back. He got his bride and they all went back to the father's house for the feast. And the five foolish ones, they, when they, it says it right here, they show up <clears throat> afterwards, came also the other virgins. They finally caught up to the wedding, to the wedding and, and they said, Lord, open to us, open the door. It said right there in verse 12, but he answered and said, verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You know, I was thinking the other day, I got one of my kids in here. I don't like picking on them too much, but then again, you know, that's what happens. You know, they always say a preacher's kid. Oh, you ruined your kids because you became a preacher. No, that's a bunch of, it's a bunch of bull. My kids, my kids, if, if they were ruined, they were ruined long before I ever became a preacher because I was already telling about Jesus before I ever stood behind a pulpit. But what I want you to know is I was thinking about, I was thinking about you the other day, kid. I was thinking about your sister, too. I know y'all love God. But at the same time, you know, sometimes I wonder, I hope, I hope everything's okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I think the same thing about my own self. I hope everything's okay. I hope I'm, come on, Lord, I want to serve you. I hope, I hope they're all right. Because, see, you, you can't get in on somebody else's oil. Right. You can't get in on somebody else's oil. There aren't any grandchildren in the kingdom of heaven. Can't get in on daddy's salvation. No. He only has children and he only has those that he's married to. And you're either going to receive him by faith today and be counted in that number or else you won't. And this whole world has a way of pulling us away from the Lord. And it has a way of blinding us to the things of God. And so I just want you to know, listen, you ain't going to borrow nobody else's oil. Amen. Amen. You better get some of your own oil. Amen. You better keep your wig trimmed. Amen. You better be ready and listen for the shout. You better be ready and listen for the trumpet sound. Hallelujah. All right. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. This is another one 
that, you know, this is now during the betrothal process again. I told you we were going to kind of go back and forth. Another parable. Another kingdom of heaven parable. So now we're in the midst of the betrothal. The first one, the king has a wedding that he's asking people to come to. And the second one, the virgins, the bridegroom comes back and five of them weren't ready. And in this one right here, this is now during this time frame known as salvation history. And it says in verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept. His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. What is a tear? A tear is a weed. It's a poisonous weed. And when it first sprouts up, you can't tell the difference. It looks just like wheat. When it gets a little bit more mature, then you start noticing it looks different than the wheat. And it's not the same thing. And it's poisonous. And what ends up happening is, is that it says, When the blade was sprung up, verse 26, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household... Householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then has it tares? In other words, you put good seed in the field. See, that's the gospel. The seed of the good gospel produces a good harvest. A false gospel, false doctrine allows bad harvest to come. And we have both of those taking place in the midst of the church age today. We're in the midst of a time frame known as the betrothal. We're waiting for the bridegroom to come back. Be careful of the doctrine that you allow yourself to sit under. Be careful of the preachers that you allow yourself to listen to. It can be a gospel that says everything goes and it can also be a gospel that says that's built upon rules and regulations. The truth of the gospel is right there there that says Jesus did it he's the righteous one it's not what you do that brings liberty it's what he did and your faith in that that brings liberty and if they ain't preaching that to you brothers and sisters they're not preaching to you the truth amen, amen. and so the, the servant said shall we go ahead and take them out in verse 28 he said unto them an enemy has done this and that's the enemy the enemy comes over there with false doctrine and he plants that inside of people's churches Oh, Lord, help us. And those people sit there in the pew and they hear a false doctrine and it begins to corrupt their faith. Preachers are going to be held accountable. This preacher is going to be held accountable. It says right here, verse 29, but it will doubt, then it says verse 28, the second part. Will, do you wish that we would go and gather them up? So now that we see these tears, should we go pull them up? He says, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. All right. First Thessalonians chapter four. See, what I wanted you to see there is another sleepiness. People have fallen asleep on the job and they missed the appointed time. Just as the, fir the virgins were sleepy and they missed the appointed time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I don't think we're too much longer into this. Bear with me a little bit. I'm a long-winded preacher. i got to be honest with you. Used to be people would show up over here with energy drinks. <laughs> Drinking energy drinks. i got to stay away, man. This dude's going to keep me here all night long. I'm going to try to... Oh, yeah, you're taking a sip every now and then. I got you. All right. 1 Thessalonians 4. Chapter, starting at verse 13. It says, I would not have... Now, we're talking about the rapture of the church now. All right? What is the rapture of the church? Have you ever heard of that? It talks about that there's coming a day whenever Jesus is coming back for his church. And that things are going okay. You're going to hear me read about it right here. Everything seems to be fine. Everybody's going about their daily business, doing their thing. And then all of a sudden, in the twinkling of an eye, everything changes. The Lord takes his church out from this earth. And so it says right here in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That's talking about people that have died. Talking about believers that have died. That you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again... Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, we're waiting for the bridegroom to come back, amen, shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, those that have died in Christ before, we're not going to prevent them from going to the Lord. He says right here, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So here's the bridegroom coming back for the bride. There's a shout of the archangel, and the shofar, if you will, permit it that way, is blown, amen, and it signals that the bridegroom has, has returned, amen, for, for the bride. And it says right here that what's going to happen is, is that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I don't want to stop there. I want to read into chapter five a little bit. It says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For, your, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You're not going to know exactly when the Lord's coming. And there's no question in my mind that that's talking about the rapture because we just read about the rapture and now we're reading about it right here. Again, there's no break. There's no chapter five whenever they first wrote it. There's no commas or periods or chapters. It's all one flowing letter and the same thought has to do with the rapture. It says that it comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety. That's interesting. I think we're going to get into that more as we get closer to talking about the Antichrist. They say peace and safety. Yeah. Everything's going good. We finally found somebody to help us figure this thing out. And as soon as they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. That day should not overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light, the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Now, I was going to turn to Matthew 26, but just real quick, I want to remind you of the story because I, I, I want to go ahead and finish up. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he brings with him his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he, the Bible says that he said that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt like your soul was exceedingly sorrowful? Have you ever been had such heaviness of heart that you really don't even know if you're going to be able to make it one more day? I mean, whatever your situation is, or whatever your situation has been, where you feel such heaviness of heart, that it's nearly that you can't, you can't bear it. And, and what I want you to know is, is that I know that whenever we turn back around and we look at what Jesus is going through, it might make us feel a little bit silly, but the truth of the, because of what we're going through, but the truth of the matter is, is that we feel it. And it hurts. And it's painful. And, and Jesus, the Bible says that he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. And this is our Jesus. The, the one that's going to, he's gonna, about to bear the brunt He's about to bear the entirety of the sin of humanity upon himself. Every devil of hell is coming against him. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Tarry here for a moment and pray. And then he goes off to the side and he, he gets down and he, he begins to seek the Father. And, and, and he's, he has the, the sweat of blood. And then he gets up and what, he comes and he finds his disciples sleeping. What I want you to know is this, is that I'm not picking on the disciples. Amen. I understand that they knew Jesus better than I know Jesus. I'm trying to make a point that we're all sus subject to getting sleepy. And I just want to encourage you tonight to let's not get sleepy, Lord. Help us not to become sleepy. Help us not to become tired in the midst of this walk. 
Your soul was exceedingly sorrowful. Do you understand that Jesus felt more pain? He endured more than you and I will obviously ever go through. And that he went before us so that he could understand what we're going through. So that he could be our comforter. So that he could strengthen us. So that he could lift us up and walk with us. So that he could hold our hand in the midst of the trial. What you need tonight is to hold on to Jesus in the midst of your trial. Amen. Amen. And to learn with him. And to walk with him. And to let him bring you through. I'm telling you, if you'll hold on to him, he'll give you the victory that you're searching for. But you can't go to sleep and you can't quit in the midst of the trial. You have to hold on to him. Amen? Amen. Whatever that looks like to you, whatever you're going through, the Lord will lead you to the truth and what, what, what it means to, to hold on. Listen, real quick. Psalm 121. I got five minutes. Because I'm the preacher. Psalm 121. I got good news for you tonight. The God of Israel doesn't take a nap. Everybody else might get sleepy. The God of Israel doesn't take a nap. Psalm 121. I was reading behind one commentator and he called this like a, the, the pilgrim psalm. Because if you think about it, he's talking about hills. It's like this, it's like this fellow here is walking through the Judean hills, the lower part of Israel, and it was a hilly country. It's where David would have taken care of all those sheep before he was king. And he's on this guy's on a pilgrimage. And he says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. What do you have need of tonight? The God that you serve made heaven and earth. There's nothing impossible for him to do for you. There's nothing impossible for him to deliver you out of. Amen? Amen. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. Oh, that encouraged me right there. That's really what I wanted to tell you tonight. That's one thing I don't want you to forget. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. What does that mean? He will not give permission, ultimately, for your foot yeah. to be moved. You're the one that's going to give permission. Amen. See, because if you'll hold on to the God of glory... If you'll hold on to the covenant that he offered, and if you'll say with everything that's in your heart, Lord, I don't want my foot to be moved. I want to hold on to you. He will not grant permission for your fall. He might grant permission for a trial. He might even orchestrate it himself. He might throw a test down there and you might feel exceedingly sorrowful. How in the world am I going to get myself out of the midst of that? Well, you're not. But if you'll hold on to him, he will not suffer for your He's got to hold on to you in the midst of your trial. And look at this. It says, Behold. It says, He will not suffer your foot to be moved. He that keeps thee will not slumber. <laughs> you might take a nap, but he won't. Behold, he that keeps Israel shall neither, neither sleep, slumber, nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Hallelujah. He is your victorious warrior tonight. Now listen, I'm going to close with this. I promise I'm closing. I still got three minutes. Whenever the bridegroom would come back, it's, you know, we don't have any young, we got one young lady, but you know, well, I got my daughter too, but it's all good. It was PG-13 Bible study, I told y'all that. Whenever the bridegroom would come back for his bride, this was a big thing. Virginity was a big thing back in these days, man. Look, this time frame of testing for this betrothal, whenever, whenever the wedding night came, they had to produce a bloody garment. It just is what it is. That's what it was on the Jewish night. Whenever so the these these women would go out, they'd bring the bridegroom, they'd find the bride, they'd bring them back to the father's house. I know that this is a little bit strange and it even makes me feel a little bit weird, but they'd go back for this feast, and then the, the husband and the wife would go into the chamber, they would have they would consummate, and everybody's waiting outside during the feast to see the bloody cloth. So, yeah, I know it's kind of embarrassing, but that's what they were waiting for. We got to see it, the proof of the virginity. And so what I want you to know is this, is that the betrothal time that's taking place shows us that there's a time frame that we are being tested to be faithful to the Lord. And if they couldn't produce the bloody garment, then there was a problem. Because see, now all, he, he's able to divorce her. And, and so the whole thing is just really kind of a mess, if you understand what I'm saying. 
What I wanted to tell you was I was turning to Revelation 19 to close this thing out. And I wanted to tell you that, you know what, there's no spiritual virgins in this house tonight. Each and every one of us don't have any purity to offer the Lord. Right? We're all in the same boat. We can't produce a bloody garment. But I got good news for you. Because we have one that did. Hallelujah. And it says right here in Revelation 19, starting at verse 11. And it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You see, the armies of heaven were clothed in white linen, representative of that wedding garment, representative of the righteousness that had been placed upon them. And they could be clothed in white linen and the righteousness of Christ because of the garment that he wore, which was a vesture that was dipped in blood. And that blood was his sinless blood that was shed when he died on the cross. I got good news for you tonight. We're in the midst of a betrothal time. We're waiting on our bridegroom to come back and yes we haven't been we none of us have any purity or righteousness to offer unto him but he's offered us his righteousness and purity and we're clothed with his righteousness tonight and I